Apple Card is the perfect credit card for every purchase. It has cashback rewards unlike others. You earn unlimited daily cashback on every purchase, receive it daily, and can grow it at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone and start earning and growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. I teach a lot of music and I teach a lot of comics as well. And I think that comics is a great tool for education. It's a great, like, symbolic container that can stand for just about anything. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I'm your other host, Nate Chinen. Nate, it is so nice to see you again. Tell me, whose voice did we hear at the top of the show? That is Dave Chisholm an acclaimed graphic novelist who specializes in stories about jazz rooted both in research and his own experience. So wait, he is a jazz musician who also draws comics about jazz music and musicians? That is correct. He's an expert with a highly specific niche, but I dare say even if you're not a jazz maniac like me, I think there's <laughs> a lot in his work to get excited about. Wow. And why did you want to speak to him right now? Well, I've been an admirer of Dave's work for several years, uh, and I was just really blown away by his latest book, which is called Miles Davis and the Search for the Sound, which, uh, you know, the title should give you some idea of the subject and scope of this book. Indeed. Wow. That is fascinating. I am very excited to hear this interview, but Tell me, do you have an extra segment that's exclusively for Slate Plus members? And if so, what will they hear? June, how did you know? Um, <laughs> you know, so Dave, we had in Dave a connoisseur of both the music of Miles Davis and the world of comics. Um, and I, I I am an expert in one of those two things. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to hit him up for recommendations uh, in, in both areas. So I asked him for three essential Miles Davis albums and three mind-blowing graphic novels. Um, so that's, you know, it's tough to, to winnow it down to just three, but I asked him not to overthink it, and he really came through. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're a Slate Plus member, you will hear that at the end of the episode. And if you aren't, it's really easy to join as a Slate Plus member. You get to hear extra segments on this show and others such as The Waves and Mom and Dad are Fighting. You'll also get bonus episodes of podcasts like Big Mood, Little Mood and Slow Burn. And of course, you will never hit a paywall at Slate.com. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. All right, let's hear Nate's conversation with Dave Chisholm. Dave Chisholm, thank you for coming on Working to talk about your process. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Nate. You know, I have to say, in this new graphic novel and in your previous books, including Enter the Blue from last year and Chasing the Bird, Charlie Parker in California from 2020, there's something you do, which is to take full advantage of the visual language of comics to get inside the musical language of jazz. So so this is inherently a feat of translation from one medium to another. Um, and so my first, my first question to you is, how did you get there? I suppose the eureka moment, if we want to call it that, is just cracking open like a score for like a piece of music and looking at the mm. notation and saying like, well, this is a temporarily unfixed version of a temporarily fixed piece of music right oh um, yeah and then yeah. and sort of like it sort of snowballed from there uh in a in a sense because it's like well this little dot on a on a staff represents the note a right 
uh, that little F beneath it represents play this like loudly with force, right? Right, right. All the little bits of musical jargon. Like, so what if I just like decided the paneling was rhythm? What if I decided the amount of detail that I put into the work is um, correspondent directly to the amount of detail in a given piece of music? Or what does color represent? And then it sort of became a, like, I don't know if the right word is like isomorphism, where you kind of yeah, like lay, right. o- overlay one uh, set of um, constraint or co- one set of um, rules and regulations upon another set of rules and see like, well, which one corresponds to which one? And you want a one to one ratio as much as you can, or for the sake of my books, um, as much as the story can bear. Because I think it does, it can get a little bit maybe. Um, if I was, it, it's not a, let, let's put it this way. The graphic novel, the comic medium is not a space efficient medium. So the, <laughs> right. there's a bit at the end of chasing the bird, the Charlie Parker graphic novel I did. That is like a quote unquote silent comic. It's just a purely musical depiction, right? And it's mm-hmm. um 18 consecutive pages with no text on the page, but only like uh, these birds flying around on the page, rep- following the contour of like, Relaxing at Camarillo by Charlie Parker. And across those 18 pages, I think it turned out really cool, but that covers like a total of 24 measures of music. So it's like not exactly right, um, right. like a total of maybe like 45 seconds of music. So it's not space efficient, but either way, it, it's allowed me to like sort of combine these like expertise my expertise in like multiple fields and then like a sense of formal playfulness in each of these fields to kind of try to understand how to translate one like formally inventive piece of media to another kind of form forward piece of media and honestly like I I love it it's like a total obsession of mine and it really informs everything I do even the uh, comic work that I do that is not directly uh, musical. Wow. Well, Dave, you're blowing my mind with this, um, th- especially this key insight about the musical score as as also, you know, <laughs> effectively um, mediated. Right. Yeah. You mentioned the three degrees and, and we're talking literal degrees, not not like, you know, six degrees of Kevin Bacon here. We're, we're talking actual degrees that you earned. And <laughs> and uh, it's been a decade since you received your doctorate in jazz trumpet from the Eastman School of Music. Yeah, th- which thanks is... for reminding me. That's depressing. That's <laughs> super depressing. <laughs> That's some pretty heavy musical training. And, and you know, based on your answer just now, I, I think I sort of know uh, <laughs> what you're going to say here. But, but I wanted to ask, how important is that, you know, musical and technical understanding to what you do? I think it's important for me. Like I want these, I I like authenticity in this, for this kind of thing, right? As much, Mm -hmm. especially authenticity about the art itself. I don't think I'm alone in saying that like uh, the vast majority of pieces of media about jazz musicians or otherwise tends to fall short in the realm of capturing the real essence of what the art actually is. It's about everything Mm -hmm. else, but the art. Right. It's about everything right, else right. but the art. Like it, it's the, like the cliche is like um, in a movie about ex jazz musician or ex musician. Finally, when the music starts to show up in the movie, they overlay it with dialogue. They put dialogue over the top of it and the music mm-hmm. becomes like wallpaper, like background stuff, like music, like a musical score. And not that musical scores aren't super cool. Like I love film music, but you would think that if a if you were making a movie or a TV show about musicians there would be like some like extended periods of time where it's like this is the music you know and so for a book like the miles davis book it's a really dense read it's a it's a pretty uh it's a pretty like crammed it's a jam-packed like full of information yeah but i like to think that the the art style the panel layouts the way i'm inking things the way i'm coloring things the way mm-hmm. it shifts from chapter to chapter is telling readers something about the music that was happening at the time that I'm depicting uh, in a way that sort of like takes like a front and center kind of like position, I suppose. Right, right. Well, you know, the, uh, there's that quote that we often hear. I know you're as familiar with it as I am. Um, 
writing about music is like <laughs> dancing about architecture, sure, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and and that line has been misattributed to everyone from Elvis Costello to Thelonious Monk, and you know, so on and so on. But I, I think it's also been misunderstood as some kind of message about futility. Yeah. Because your work makes me think. Wait a minute. This kind of is dancing about architecture. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. <clears throat> in the way that in the way that you are balancing kinetic movement and structural detail, oh, you know. Thanks, man. Yeah, I uh I mean, I suppose yeah, like I think I think I have a similar reaction to that quote uh to what you're saying is that like I want to see a dance about architecture. I would love to see <laughs> right. a dance about architecture. In fact, I'm sure that like Alvin Ailey has done a dance about architecture or Merce Cunningham has like, like I'm sure there've been plenty of amazing dances that deal with architecture in some kind of like meaningful way in the promo materials for the Miles Davis book. I suggested this and, it, and I think it, Z2 was cool enough to like run with it. Is that like, I wanted to say this book is synesthesia inducing. Mm, um, yeah. And like I, the, the idea is like, we want people to, for, for me, like the goal is like to make people engage with music on a deeper level beyond just like that thing that we all do where we hear something and go, I like this or like, I hate this. And instead right. thinking about it, like what's really happening. Hopefully a book like this can, books like these can give, give people like um, permission to try something or like encouragement to try something that might otherwise be daunting. Yeah. I mean, you're not shying away from um, pretty uh, inside kind of musicological, uh, detail in this book, you know, where like, what is modal jazz, right? Yeah. Like, what, what does that mean versus, you know, versus chordal improvisation? You know, this is something that I think, uh, when you, when you try to write about it, you can almost see a reader's eyes begin to glaze over if they're right. not musically inclined but <clears throat> you you do something so cool with it which is to you know you know as you say that there's there's a color palette that you incorporate um in sort of character terms um mm -hmm. you know the, the mood is is conveyed the intention is conveyed and you also sort of connect it you know via Miles's story you connect it with things like flamenco music or you know, polyrhythmic African drumming. You know, mm -hmm. it's like yeah. taking these aspects of his biography and using them to illuminate yeah. the musical innovations, right? right so it's, right. it stri strikes me as very astute in terms of like knowing what an audience might be able to handle. Mm. I think that that's also like the educator side of me coming out mm -hmm. too. Because um, I sort of like, I teach a lot of music and I teach a lot of comics as well. And, um, and I think that comics is a great tool for education. It's a great, like, kind of symbolic container that can stand for just about anything. And when I think about teaching, like, a music class, like, say, for example, like, a gen ed college music class, like, music 101 for, like, a mm -hmm. general population, um, you might be teaching, like, group piano, basic solfege, uh, basic, like, notation and, like, chord whatever chord qualities and stuff but really ultimately what you're teaching is music appreciation like ultimately yeah. you're teaching people like how to engage with music on a deeper level and um and teaching like private lessons with beginners and everything i think i i think i have developed a, a pretty solid understanding of like what people can handle and mm -hmm. what is going to be like flying above people's heads like just kind of leaving people in the dust and it's good to hear that your assessment that you think that it, this book is 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 gonna like reach people in that way. I I think it is too. I think it hits a nice balance. Yeah, yeah. I, and I hadn't thought about the extent to which your your time in the classroom would be influencing that, but of course it would, mm -hmm. right? Because you've you've seen those glazed over eyes <laughs> <laughs> and understood how to prevent that. Yeah, right? yeah. The challenge with a book like this Miles Davis one and um and the and I guess the Charlie Parker one as well is finding a balance where I can like reach those people, but not like have the eyes glaze over of the diehards. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so, right. um, well, I, we'll see, we'll see what, how, we'll see what people think of this Miles Davis book. We'll see what the diehards yeah. think. Yeah. I don't want to forget to ask a, a very technical question. Um, 
but a simple one too. Do you draft with the music on? Like, do you do you listen while you're drawing and, and writing? Sometimes, yeah. You know, for this project, I did try to like have, at least for part of the drawing process, like listen to the music for each like section of his career that's highlighted. I, I just have always really loved like a live evil band with like yeah. Keith Jarrett. Um, in particular, there's like a bunch of like live European recordings of the live evil band, but with like Ndugu Chancellor on drums instead mm-hmm. of Jack Dijonette. To me, that's like the moment where Miles' music sort of like transcends being jazz or stops being jazz. It moves on to being something totally different. And you can feel this real push pull in that music between like this kind of like rock steady groove of Michael Henderson and Ndugu like kind of battling against Keith Jarrett's like constant mm. like pushing and qu- and like pushing out into outer space with what he's doing right. and I just like lo- I love that chemistry I did get hung up on that I just like listened to probably like every single possible YouTube video and then like the whole like cellar door session and stuff like that um so I, I did get stuck yeah. on that one. Some of the best music ever. I, lo- I love <laughs> it. Yeah. We'll be back with more of Nate's conversation with Dave Chisholm. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now, that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Apple Card is the perfect credit card for every purchase. It has cashback rewards unlike others. You earn unlimited daily cashback on every purchase, receive it daily and can grow it at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone and start earning and growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Listeners, we really, really want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we answer listener questions. So please tell us your creative challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can also send a voice memo to that address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK and leave a voicemail. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Nate's conversation with Dave Chisholm. Okay, we've been talking in mostly visual terms, right, about your fantastic artwork, but you're also working with narrative. and in the case of this book, creative nonfiction, really. Um, so I want to, I want to let people know the first, the very first panel in this book is a black square with a dateline 1982 and a blunt utterance yeah. that you can easily imagine in Miles's voice. Um, yeah. Dave, do you want to, do you want to go ahead and say it? Uh, Miles says, fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, <laughs> it's the first line in the book is, is it's, I mean, it, and it's true. It's really true to form. Um, but we begin to realize on the subsequent panels that that Miles is in a doctor's office after a stroke, and he's he's kind of taking in the therapeutic 
recommendation that he's supposed to start sketching and drawing, um, you know, which he sort of initially balks at, but then kind of comes around to like, hmm, you know. And so this is a really cool framing device for, you know, a, a way into this story. And it yeah. also feels like a, a nod of recognition on your part. Um, <laughs> That raises, you know, a couple of questions for me. And and the first one I'll get to is um, your decision to base pretty much all of the text in this book on Miles' own words, either from the autobiography or from interviews and, and other sources. Um, and, and this is kind of necessarily the opposite approach that you took with the Charlie Parker book, where the story is largely told from, you know, testimonials and, and other people remembering him. So um, on a practical level, how did you experience that different angle of approach? When I was doing the Charlie Parker book, I knew I was going to use the different visual styles for each chapter based on the point of view of the narrator. So each style, each chapter has a different visual style, a different storytelling style, a different set of rules. And I, and I remember thinking like, like this might, I mean, I remember thinking like, Oh, you know, like, if I ever did like a Miles Davis book, I would come back to this conceit of like changing styles, but it wouldn't, it would be based on his own musical evolution since his own, mm -hmm. since obviously it's like a legendary, like the uh, um, radicalness of his evolution throughout his career. And, um, and then when the, and then, you know, like thanks to the Charlie Parker book, this opportunity came to me and, um, and I, and it really felt like a sequel to the Charlie Parker book. And, mm -hmm. um, and obviously I wasn't, I didn't want to fall back on the same framing device because there's so much, um, of Miles's first person accounts of what's going on. It just made total sense to have like the narration instead of the narration be other being other people talking about Miles to have it be in, um, Miles Davis's own, uh, words, uh, even when they kind of contradict like the, mm -hmm. like the reality of what happened or even even if they contradict what he says about things like he talks about <clears throat> right, how much he cares right. about somebody and then his actions completely uh subvert that and completely reject that like so it's so um you know it did like in that then that plays into like the whole gemini like twin like good like dr jekyll mr hyde kind of aspect mm -hmm. of his personality and and so in a sense it was like a, a bit of a no brainer to, to do that. Thing. Cause, cause why not like go right to the source and use that really valuable text, you know? Yeah. Um, and then was it easy? No, it was a lot of research and reading <laughs> and like sifting <laughs> right. and sort of like, like collecting quotes by from miles and like saying like, well, this one could fit in this bucket or this book. This one mm -hmm. could be about the second quintet or about Charlie Parker, right? Like, if it's about band leading, it could be about Charlie Parker, but it could also be about his band leading philosophies in the seventies. Right. If it was yeah, something about yeah. like, um, like, uh, drummers, it could be about Tony Williams or it could be about Philly Joe Jones. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it was like really reorganizing, um, a lot of these like little snippets all over the place and sort of like figuring out where they were going to belong. Yeah. So I want to get to my, my second question here, which is about Miles himself, right? Everyone who approaches him as a human subject, especially especially today, um, is confronted with a serious quandary, right? Because his behavior, especially with respect to the women in his life and the family he left behind, you know, it, it, it's often pretty atrocious. Um, and you're unsparing about this, um, but in the same way that Miles is unsparing in the autobiography. Right. Um, so I wondered, what was that a tightrope walk for you? Or, um, and I guess, uh, you know, on top of that, was it helpful specifically to be working in the medium of, of comics mm -hmm. where protagonists often get rendered with, you know, their faults and their struggles uh -huh. yeah. on full display? Gosh, there's, there's a couple different tightropes. So like the first one was like, I'm working with, his family for this book yeah and it's right. this painful dark stuff that is honestly like you said he's candid he's unnervingly candid in his autobiography about all this stuff and um and so the first the first was like i'm just gonna 
be like right away I was like I think we should be really honest about about the bad side of him the the negative parts of his story and they were like Mm -hmm. they they were very supportive of that really really like um understanding of that and then in scripting it was kind of like being tasteful in that line Mm -hmm. where it's like not glorifying it not exploiting violence against women not glorifying any of the racial violence that he suffered yeah not like making sure that like it's there but not like in a way that like looks really badass you know <laughs> like how mm-hmm. violence in comics comics and violence have a really frustrating friendship right because like yeah. you know like every comic book movie ends with a big fight scene like every solution is like mm-hmm. well let's punch it let's punch it until right. it until it's uh, like either dies or changes its mind right mm-hmm. and like i don't know about you nate but i've never solved a problem by punching it in my life <laughs> right that's not a problem solver and so like when I was writing the script, I had like a few kind of ideas and I, and definitely this aspect of it is where, um, where I, where I got a lot of like help and guidance from both, uh, Aaron Davis, Miles, the son, as well as, um, my editor Rance Hosley, um, mm-hmm. who, who had some really like clever ways of like showing it, not telling it. Um, or like implying it, not showing it kind of thing. And uh, one of the most compelling, mysterious things about Miles Davis, it's like, how is this, how is this, does this person exist? Right? Right. He's like this trumpet player who embodies all the worst qualities in a sense of like trumpet players, which is like these (laughs) macho, like toxic male, like wants to be intimidating, is very tough Mm -hmm. and macho and, but then his his music is like the opposite of higher, faster, louder, for the most part in his career, right? Right. There's a even when he is playing higher, faster, louder, there's a there's a certain vulnerability to it. There's a sense sensitivity to it. He's extremely sensitive as a listener to the band around him. He's always mm-hmm. responding in exactly the right way to the band around him. It's never like my way or the highway with him. He's always in negotiation with the band around him. In, mm-hmm. in a way that it's not really like stereotypically like masculine kind of like trumpet playing, right? Well, earlier you invoked the Jekyll and Hyde aspect and the, and the you know, and Miles himself talks about being a Gemini. Yeah, um, oh yeah, he leans into it big time. It's definitely complicated. It's hard. You know, this is like my greatest like musical artistic North Star in my whole life, really. Yeah, and that, that honesty, I mean, that's a striking thing about your book because... I don't think that you let him off the hook. This feels like a pretty clear-eyed assessment of who he was, even though you are assuming his first-person perspective. You know, like the the wreckage is not invisible in this telling of his life. Um, And there is sort of context. I mean, we do understand the toll of racism and, you know, and and the, the pain that he was in and the you know, drugs. Yeah. I mean, it's all in there, but, um, there's, there's kind of a crucial, there's a, there's just enough critical distance. I feel in your telling that it's clear that this is neither a condemnation nor a, a hagiography, right? Um, now you, you mentioned something earlier about working with, um, Miles's family. Um, and, and, you know, maybe this is a, a good uh, way to, to bring us home in this conversation. Uh, you know, I was thinking about about graphic novels, but specifically comics in pop culture. And, you know, these days when, when we talk about that, it's almost like a shorthand for Marvel entertainment. Um, and in Hollywood, you know, there's, there's always a lot of related conversation about IP. You work in a different vein and with different materials, but you also work with IP. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the case of, of this Miles book and the Charlie Parker book, you, you got cooperation from artist estates and we haven't talked much about Enter the Blue, mm-hmm. um, your previous book. Um, but that was uh, and that's a, a beautiful original story that you tell I that I highly recommend people check out. Thanks. But that book was made with the cooperation of Blue Note Records. Right. So I wanted to ask how you would describe your relationships with these 
these various entities, you know, did it feel more like a matter of permission or more like collaboration? Um, you know, where, where does that balance fall for you? With Blue Note, the first thing I brought to them, because I was asked to pitch something to them, I brought them a nonfiction pitch about the history of Blue Note, and they were like totally not into it. And they were like, can you do something like fictional, like with time travel or something like that? Oh. And I was like, that's great. I was super excited. And then when I started, um, when I start, when I put together a pitch, they, they approved the story of for enter the blue and the conceit of it and everything like that, the like fantastic, like magical realism or fantasy conceit of the story. And then when I started sending them script pages, I wasn't getting any feedback. And then at one point, Don was the president of blue note records emailed me and was like, Hey Dave, like, you're like part of the Blue Note roster at this point. And uh, with Blue Note, with the Blue Note roster, like we don't tell people what to do ever. We just let them do what they do. We trust them. Mm. So we trust that you're going to do a good job with this book. And so it was basically like make this book however you want to make it mm -hmm. from their mouth. But with the Miles book, I would say it was definitely the most collaborative one so far. In particular, there there was some a, a nice like long conversation I had with um Miles's nephew Vincent Wilburn mm -hmm. about the time that he spent out in New York during Miles's like so-called like dark period, right? Kind of like talking about what that was like and everything. And it really, uh, I, I rewrote that whole chapter after that conversation. It was quite late in the pro project um, that I rewrote that. Uh, but in terms of like, I think the approach that that I took, that I pitched and was approved. Like all of the information is in Miles's words. And so there wasn't like a whole lot of room for collaboration beyond like kind of like little bits of feedback here and there and kind of like having the comfort according to like Miles Davis's son that I'm getting it right, mm -hmm. that I'm doing it, that it's turning out good. If the approach had been like, I want to like interview Aaron and make the graphic novel about like Aaron's relationship with his dad. That would be that would be a totally different story. Right. On one hand, I think that would be a really incredible like book. On the other hand, that's probably not the book that any that that that's probably not the book that like the people who are like putting the books out like want to see. They want mm -hmm. a book about with the with kind of like the big moments in in his public facing career and not so much a book about like familial kind of personal stuff as it were. One last question, Dave. Um is there another big book uh, cooking on the on the uh, the front burner now? Yeah, I'm. I am um, about. Let me think. About seventy pages in to uh, my next project. This one is a creator owned comic book series that's written by my friend Rick Quinn. Imagine like the like genre bending like frenetic energy of everything everywhere all at once mm -hmm. but in a story that's like about like an alternate music history mm. of the 20 of the 20th century okay with like kind of big fantastical genre kind of elements that are attached to it all told from the point of view of like very ground level characters so so um i'm really excited about this book it's very like it's very fun and pow and like powerful and i think it'll be unlike anything else that the comics world has seen in a long time um well dave congratulations again on this miles davis book it's going to be exciting to watch the responses as it enters the world because i think a lot of people are going to be very into it oh man well i hope so i'm i'm it, you i am so nervous i've told other people like my main goal is to make it so that i would make a book that that I, the last thing I want to do is disappoint 16 year old me because I was like reading comics and like just listening only to Miles Davis for like maybe like four years straight back then. And I want to make a book that that person would read and be like, holy shit, this is awesome. I think you did it. And we'll, we'll see what we'll see what the rest of the world thinks. Um, but Dave, thank you again for for joining us today. Thank you so much, Nate. I really appreciate it. 
Up next, Nate and I will talk about treating writing like music composition and how to keep track of all the elements in a large scale creative project. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right, everything you earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Hey, listeners, Wondery's podcast Business Wars is back with an incredible season that you'll want to listen to. It's all over the news, but did you know that as early as the 2010s, the dream of artificial intelligence became real? The big tech companies knew they'd have to harness this technology if they were going to win the new AI race. In fact, it was key to their very survival. But researchers within each company would soon sound the alarm that if the tech giants move too fast, the consequences could be devastating. Business Wars dives into some of the biggest corporate rivalries of all time. In their latest season, The Rise of AI, the tech behemoths fight to dominate the artificial intelligence space and reckon with the costs. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Nate, there are lots of reasons that I've been really glad that you are with us this summer, but one is that you brought Dave Chisholm to my attention. I wasn't familiar with his work, but as soon as I heard that interview, I went and I ordered Miles Davis and The Search for the Sound, and I can't wait to read it later this fall. So thank you for that. You are so welcome. Dave's deep, deep knowledge of jazz music obviously informs the creation of these comics, and I was fascinated to hear him describe those influences. In his case, they literally shape the comics. He really wants to show, you know, the panels of the comics reflecting the bars of music. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating. But hearing that conversation, I was reminded of my longtime friend and Slate colleague, Brian Lauder, whose undergraduate degree was in music composition. And he brings skills that he learned there to his editing. He's very concerned with the building of tension, the use of light motifs, and other elements that are just slightly different from other editors I've worked with. So given your music background, Nate, I wonder if you're aware of using any of the elements of music theory in your writing. You know, this may come as a surprise, but I haven't really thought about mm. this consciously. So maybe I'm not aware. But, <laughs> you know, now that you mention it, um, I mean, of course, there's an influence, right? Um, I'm so obsessed with it. And it's yeah. what I it's what I'm always thinking about. Uh, so when you mention music theory, I'll draw a distinction here between theory and practice. Um, okay. Because the first thing that comes to mind for me is rhythm, plain and simple. I've all, really always been tuned into rhythm. Um, you know, not just as a musical uh, element, but as a mode of communication. And I think that that feel for cadence and phrase uh, functions on a subconscious level, you know, whenever I compose a sentence. Interesting. Um, you know, and, and it, I don't, I, I think I mentioned this in a, a previous episode of Working when I was talking with Isaac. Um, mm -hmm. I don't tend to read my work aloud, but I do hear it in my head. So, uh -huh. uh, so the rhythm plays out in that process. Um, then there's there's also a couple of fundamental principles in music making, which I also think I utilize without really thinking about it. Um, mm. So one of these, I think, would be the idea of theme and variations, you know, wh which we encounter everywhere from J.S. Bach to Thelonious Monk. It can be a really useful way to develop an idea in a story. And then another one is call and response which exists in a, a whole lot of Afro-diasporic music, but also, you know, in the tradition of antiphonal liturgical music and various European folk musics, right? Um, and so I, I use this too on occasion. Um, it's kind of a way of, of creating a Socratic structure in a piece or, or even working your way through what might seem to be opposing ideas. Interesting. I... I... Also feel a need to praise Dave for something. 
He talked about getting an important insight into a period of Miles Davis's life from a conversation with Davis's nephew, Vincent Wilburn, which led him to make significant revisions to the book quite late in the project. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that's something that a lot of writers would have resisted. Uh, I'll just speak for myself. In my experience, when you get to a certain stage of a project, your willingness to make significant changes of your own accord, maybe somebody will kind of push you to, but just to do it off your own bat, well, you know, that intention really diminishes, let's just say. Mm -hmm. But when... The piece is a graphic novel where editing is so much more difficult because you're not just changing text. You have to do new drawings and perhaps even reconfigure panels that might affect pages and pages of the work. It's especially noteworthy. I can't believe he did that. Yeah, it's it's true. And this reminds me, we talked a bit about film in the interview. And I, I mm. imagine that this is kind of analogous to what it feels like to edit a documentary when you stumble yeah. across some pivotal new footage, you know, late in the process. And, mm -hmm. you know, because the desired end result is to have your audience not see the seams, it's on you to incorporate those changes, no matter how involved or laborious that revision has to be. But ultimately, because uh, what matters is that end result, y you have to kind of... Um, receive that late breaking insight as a gift rather right. than an obligation. Right? Oh, oh, and so it's yes. kind of an attitudinal shift. It's like, oh, oh, how fortunate that I can get it right because I have this, you know, because I, I was able to fit this in. Um, yeah. I think we've all been in that situation where like something comes late in the game and you're like, oh, how great. Oh, my <laughs> God. Uh. <laughs> but, but you've got to kind of keep it on the positive tip because really, you know, it's about what the end result is going to be. Yes. And if it's an improvement, yes. then you just have to you just have to make sure that you um, field it and incorporate it. Right. I love that reframing of gift rather than obligation. I will try very hard to take that attitude next time because you're right. It is all about kind of the result and what it leads to, but it can still be, oh, yeah. <laughs> I also really was struck by Dave's observation that musicians in popular culture are rarely shown listening to music because, yeah, as soon as he said that, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And it's true, they always start talking right over it, which mm, I don't think so. Let me share one of my pet peeves. I hate to quote Woody Allen, but something from one of his movies has stuck with me for a very, very long time. In one of his films, someone says that a Spanish character would be more convincing if he spoke Spanish and called his mother in Barcelona once in a while. And ironically, given the source, that is a good reminder that if you say your characters are from different backgrounds, they really shouldn't behave identically they should reflect the background that the creator gave them. You can't mm -hmm. just write a novel with all white characters and then, you know, change the name of one of them from Jimmy to Jamal and produce anything other than a white character named Jamal. And needless to say, Woody Allen should take his own advice when he comes to, you know, reflecting the population of New York and lots of other things. But, Nate, do you have any similar, why do they always get that wrong opinions? Yeah, well, so many, June. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, first of all, I, I have to say I share Dave's frustration over the portrayal of music and music making and musical practice mm. on film. I'm especially mm. touchy on the subject of jazz in film. I mean, uh, Whiplash? Come on. Whiplash Ridiculous. is also about a drummer, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's let's just shelve that for another time because, you know, uh, I don't want to. Uh, completely take over the, the rest of this <laughs> episode. Um, and since that was the original complaint, um, I, I feel I should tack in another direction. So so I'll, I'll talk about culture a bit. I was born and raised in Honolulu on the island of mm. Oahu. Um, and as, as you know, as everyone knows, H Hawaii is a very popular setting for all manner of pop culture stories, right? Mm. Um, either either um, stuff that's set in the islands or stuff that, you know, just uses the islands for, for you know, visual, luxurious, tropical background. Um, yeah. Now, what isn't often taken into account is that this is also a place with a particular and quite sensitive colonial history. 
and a really deep indigenous um, history and and a distinctive cultural mix, you know, mm, both mm. both historical and contemporary. So this is all to say that Hawaiian culture gets so grossly misrepresented in film and television. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so much so that I no longer get upset about it uh, mm. because that's par for the course. But... Um, because of that, it does strike me as so refreshing when I encounter a piece of popular entertainment that gets it right, even even a little right. Um, but those examples are, are really few and far between. Well, I have to ask you, can you can you think of one that that has seemed, you know, resonated and has, has felt that it was at least in part right? Um, yeah, in part. Uh, this is <laughs> this is going to be a, a really funny um, recommendation, and I, I guess I should, I should qualify it by saying that this this is a quite silly and and really ridiculous show. But <laughs> June, do you remember? Um, do you remember Doogie Howser, MD? You know, I'm not sure I ever watched it, but I definitely remember it. Yes. Yeah. So th- this was the this was the series. You know, it was a sitcom on ABC in the you know the very early 90s i think it started in 1989 and it's what uh you know it's what brought us um you know the the wonderful talents of neil patrick harris when he was right. when he was a, a young man uh, a, a child yeah. in fact and the whole premise of the show is that there's this you know child prodigy uh, who who becomes a doctor, right? He's like a he's he's a, a medical prodigy. He is working in a hospital as a doctor. You know, it's it's a it's a really, um, you know, it's a patently ridiculous uh, concept. Right. But it was a it was a pretty good show. I remember watching it back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so a few years ago, uh, Disney Plus rebooted this show with a new setting and a new character, a new set of characters. And this this is called Doogie Kamealoha, MD. <laughs> um, have you heard of this? I get you. No, I had never heard of it before. Yeah, but... I mean, this is one of those things that I, I don't think it was really, I don't think Disney marketed it. I, I think it's one of those shows that unless you are already like a habitué of the Disney Plus <laughs> right. uh, you know, streaming service, which you know a lot of parents right. are, um, mm-hmm. you may never have even heard of this show. Um, it ran in two seasons and it was and it was then canceled. Um, and I think you know the cancellation was justified. It kind of <laughs> right. it did everything that it could do. Um, now so back to your question, um, the thing that makes this show kind of deliciously watchable for me, is the not only the island setting, um, but it's the ear for um, local culture and local um, uh-huh. dialect, and and uh-huh. especially really like what makes it all worthwhile is uh, the presence of Jason Scott Lee, who plays Doogie's dad, and and his character uh, is you know it's a total caricature. I mean this this is a, a very broad sitcom, right? But he plays mm-hmm. Benny Kamealoha. Who uh, who is native Hawaiian um, and part Asian and traveled to the mainland and became a, a finance bro and then <laughs> was disillusioned with it and returned home and opened a shave ice truck, you know. <laughs> and so he's yeah. this like total like surfer dude, um, you know, just really local boy, you know. Uh huh. Uh huh. And he's so funny and so true to the the local archetype. I mean, he reminds me of like members of my extended family. Um, <laughs> so it's it's a really fun um, element of what is otherwise like a, a pretty silly show. <laughs> that is amazing. I am going to seek it out now because uh, I want to get <laughs> I want to get that Aloha spirit. <laughs> Um, that's all we have time for this week, but we hope you've enjoyed the show. And if you have, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. That way you will never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like Slow Burn and Big Mood, Little Mood, and you'll never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thank you to Dave Chisholm and to this week's producer, Zach Rosen, a guy who hears the rhythm of podcasts. And thanks, as always, to our series producer, Cameron Drews. We'll be back next week with Isaac Butler's conversation with the great writer, Jonathan Lethem. Until then, get back to work.
ABC Friday. It just takes one great idea to change your life. Shark Tank returns for its 15th season. I didn't know I was going to cry right now. <laughs> with new guest sharks, Jason Blum of Blumhouse, Michael Rubin of Fanatics, and Candace Nelson of Sprinkles Cupcakes. I'm going to make you an offer. On a scale of 1 to 10. I've never seen anything like this on Shark Tank. This season is a 15. I totally believe in you. Shark Tank premieres Friday on ABC and stream on Hulu. What happens when the right people connect? At MITRE, breakthrough technology advances, people fulfill their passions, diversity fuels innovation, and our way of life thrives. From health to transportation and global security, cyber and AI, to space and back again, there's no higher calling than making the world a safer place. Let's connect at MITRE.org careers. That's M-I-T-R-E dot org careers.